Why is what we see so important for how we perceive flavor? I will tell you all about it. Why do you taste with your eyes? This is the University of the Netherlands. How do we taste? With our tongue, right? Maybe even back in school you learned about the different taste receptors on your tongue. But just think back whenever you had a cold. Most likely it affected your ability to taste, and food suddenly tasted very bland. But actually there was nothing wrong with your taste receptors. This means that perceiving flavor is not only limited to your taste receptors, but also requires smell. And what if I tell you that also vision and touch play an important role in how we taste? In this lecture, I will explain how our senses work together and how our brain sometimes tricks our senses when perceiving flavor. Knowing how our senses interact when tasting is very important to be able to reduce sugars, salt, and fat in foods, but still deliver that same wonderful sensory experience. Let's start with the two most obvious senses used for perceiving flavor, that is smell and taste. The link between smell and taste is very strong. And actually back in the days, it was even debated whether there were one instead of two senses. You could say that the nose is the chimney of the mouth. The earlier example I gave you of tasting when having a cold illustrates that the closeness between these two senses is a very obvious one. But did you know that, for instance, our ability to detect a smell depends on what substance you have in your mouth. For example, if I give you three bottles to smell, and two contain an odorless solution, such as water, and another one contains a cherry almond smell at a very subtle level. Then I ask you to detect which bottle contains the odor solution. I remember it can be very hard because it's a very subtle. You would be able to detect this odor much easier when you would have something sweet in your tongue. So your threshold to detecting the smell lowers, even if you're not really perceiving the sweetness of what you have in your mouth. But if you would have something savory instead, it would become much harder to detect the sweet smell. Now, this exactly was observed in a group of American participants, and most likely it would happen to you too, if you're from a Western culture. However, the opposite pattern of results was observed in Japanese participants. That is, they were able to detect the sweet odor with something savory in their mouth. So why would these two different cultures be able to detect a sweet smelling solution while having something either sweet or savory in their mouth respectively? The answer is because throughout our life, we're exposed to certain combinations of smell and taste. And since in Japan, these sweet savory combinations is more common, they are able to detect the odor better when having something savory in their mouth. In other words, the combinations we're used to make us better detecting a signal from one sense when we're exposed to, even unconsciously, to a matching or congruent signal via another sense. Even odors that are presented subliminally that is, at the level that falls below our awareness, can also enhance taste perception. What does this mean? This means that these effects cannot really be accounted for in terms of what we know or what we might expect. Rather, what we see is more likely an automatic multisensory integration. So we subconsciously combine or blend the information from distinct senses into what we call a unitary percept, that is, as if belonging to the same object. However, the taste and smells that are better integrated in your brain would depend on the particular combinations that you're most familiar with. Interestingly, also research shows that we start to learn our responses to, to specific flavors or will steal in the womb. And newborns express this preference towards certain odors, a sign of, by the way, their turning of the head, as a function of the foods that they're consumed by their mother during pregnancy. So, clearly we know that taste and smell are central in flavor perception. But what about texture? Surely texture also plays a crucial role in our construction of flavor. So let's go to our lab space over here to illustrate the role of texture in taste perception with a very, very easy example. Here we have already all the ingredients prepared. So, the example is that if you have, for instance, 100 milliliters of cherry juice, 
and you add a lot of sugar, 100 grams. Let's do this. Well, roughly, if we were to add all this amount of sugar, we would be able to say that this is very, very sweet. And actually, perhaps you would even say that it's not really pleasant because of the amount of sweetness you would perceive. However, if we would add some thickener in here to solidify the liquid, suddenly the perception of sweetness changes completely. We perceive it as much less sweet. That is why we find the sweetness in gummies tolerable. The texture affects the taste perception. To make this even more interesting, do you think you could clearly identify the flavor of a food without seeing it? Visual cues play an important role on multisensory flavor perception. Changing the color of a food alters its perceived taste and flavor. But does it really change it? Of course, flavor perception after all is constructed in the brain. And there are many examples out there. Take for instance the most famous one, which is white wines that are colored red. In research studies, even experts, when tasting them, they would say and be really convinced about it that actually it's red wine. And they really have this professional mentality about it. They really believe in their abilities to detect sensory notes. So it's quite amazing how their brain really changes what they think they perceive in the mouth based on what they see. So can we say we're getting fooled by what we see? Not really. It's just our brain helping us cope and trying to make sense of the outer world based on the available information. To understand this, let's take a look at how our brain processes sensory information from the external world, that is, outside our body. Imagine our receptors are exposed to loads of sensory signals, such as images, smells, tastes, sounds, and they are open to everything around us. Our brain immediately starts a filtering process and determines what information is relevant for us to survive or for which actions we need to take. It is said that roughly about 10% of the sensory signals enter a system for further processing. These signals that we may have attended to in some way enter the interpretation stage. What is it? You might have seen a picture like this where you have to say what you see. In reality, it's nothing else but black lines or dots over a white background. But your brain immediately finds patterns to make sense out of the picture. In this case, it's a Dalmatian dog in the snow. And you might recognize this based on previous exposure with a similar pattern of signals, assuming that all of you have seen a Dalmatian before. With this simple example in the visual domain, you start to understand how the brain needs very, very little information sensory input to complete the whole picture for us. That picture might be very different from person to person, depending on their background, their expectations, and so on. In the food perception, the same concept applies. We can create flavor just by stimulating one or two senses, even if the, food, the real food is actually not in our mouth. We can reconstruct it ourselves, so to speak, as long as we have experienced it before and the cues are clear enough for our brain to feed them together. Remember that a brain is a very, very efficient machine, always tries to minimize the efforts for us. In fact, we could say that throughout our life, it has created a parallel image about how the world is, so that we can navigate in it comfortable without having to pay much attention to all the signals that surround us. One of the most frequently asked questions is whether there's a hierarchy of the senses. Most studies involving visual stimulation have demonstrated that the visual dominance is there. So the idea that what we see normally dominates the other senses. It is not surprising that vision, which carries the richest information, ends up dominating. That is what we commonly say, I appeal is half a meal. And going back to the red wine example, when we see it, automatically, our brain coats the red color, the transparency, the shape of the glass. And based on these few pieces of the puzzle, it would suffice to conclude that what we're going to consume is red wine. When the 
when tasting the white wine, as mentioned before, the taste and smell information gets assimilated or linked to our red wine prediction because at the end of the day, white and red wine might share similar taste and smell properties. So even if there are some differences, we might not notice them. But what if our brain is predicting this red wine, but when tasted, it's something completely different? Let's say it is sour. Then, of course, our brain is not going to assimilate that taste information to the visual information. In fact, we might be surprised or even disgusted. So in this case, our brain will correct the prediction error and store it back in our memory. So next time it will encounter a similar looking drink, it will trigger this cascade of predictions, including that it might taste sour or that actually it's not red wine. In this brain, in this way, our brain creates links between sensory information and strengthens those combinations that go occur more often in our environment to make better predictions in the future about how things might feel, taste, smell like. Note that only when something is unexpected or it does not fit the image that we have stored of the, of the world, we will notice it and act upon it. This brings us to the question, so do we actually need, need incoming sensory signals to perceive flavor? The answer is not at that moment, as long as you have perceived that flavor in the past and have stored it in the memory. Actually, studies have shown that repeatedly seeing the food or even reading the name of some ingredients, the neural response in parts of our brain that code for taste intensity smell were activated. This can even trigger us to salivate as if we had the food in our mouth. So all this knowledge about how our perception can differ from reality is not only exciting from a fundamental point of view, but knowing how different sensory signals are enhanced or suppressed when combined with each other in, in this context while eating has many different applications. For instance, for medical nutrition, knowing how to possibly mask certain unpleasant sensory characteristics is key to making a product acceptable by patients. Or on the other hand, people with impaired sensory abilities, such as smell, might be able to improve their overall flavor experience via other means. Likewise, food researchers and developers can de improve foods from a nutritional standpoint while delivering an almost identical sensory experience. And in a fine dining setting, a chef can create a, more easily a mind-blowing experience. Circling back to the main question, the way we perceive flavors is not as straightforward as you may have expected. Our brain uses certain rules to combine incoming and existing sensory information and it certainly just does not add them all up. This lecture hopefully changed your view on how we define flavor, taking it away from the conventional definition of a combination of taste and smell, and broadening it to include all the other senses. Given all the current health concerns about our diet, knowledge about multisensory flavor perception may be key to helping understand how we can improve our food choices. With this understanding, we can alter the sensory cues in food to make nutritious and sustainable food more appealing for everybody. Thanks for listening.